There's much that is going on in our world that can result in fear, sadness, uncertainty, and perhaps even a sense of hopelessness among some. There is the coronavirus and its attending circumstances, some fears of getting sick, financial hardships that are associated with its closures, stress over all life's changes that we are experiencing, and the disruption that is being encountered for our plans. And we think about all of the adjustments of going back to school and people not being able to conduct themselves in the manner that they are accustomed. Then there are the natural catastrophes that we've been encountering, floods and hurricanes, unprecedented fires in California, and the loss of life. And then there's the unrest that is being experienced in our cities and in our nation with division and hatred running rampant, people shooting and killing each other. Then there even are the spiritual disappointments. And this past week, we heard of events that have taken place that have ultimately brought disgrace to God and disgrace to God's people. So what is the solution to the seemingly hopeless and deplorable situation, the ongoing endless bad news, as it were. Are we looking to a person to deliver us, or are we looking to a God to deliver us? Do we have confidence that God can meet all of these needs? This morning, we are going to be reminded that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. We have that great passage in Ephesians chapter 2, which reads, Now to him who is able to keep you, uh, is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. In 1 Samuel chapter 13 this morning, we see in a very profound way that God was able to do exceedingly abundantly above what was asked and what was thought. God certainly acted in a way that was abundantly above all that was asked or thought. So our theme this morning is that God is to be glorified as the one who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think as revealed in his care for his people. As we look at 1 Samuel chapter 11, the first thing we notice is that God is to be glorified as the one who is able to do abundantly above all that we ask or think as revealed in the actions of the people of Jabesh Gilead. In our passage, the people of Jabesh Gilead found themselves in a virtually hopeless situation. They were being attacked by an army that was much more powerful than they were. And so the people offered themselves uh, to their attackers. They offered to surrender, verse 1 of chapter 11. Then Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. And the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, make a treaty with us and we will serve you. So they asked for a peace treaty. They asked for uh, to negotiate a peace in which they were willing to subservient themselves to the Ammonites. They were willing to become slaves. Nahash, the leader of the Ammonites, was incredibly cruel and arrogant in his response to the people of Jabesh Gilead. He was, first of all, cruel, as you notice in verse 2. But Nahash, the Ammonite, said to them, On this condition, I will make a treaty with you that I gouge out all your right eyes. Now think about that. Here is this Ammonite leader who says, you want to make a treaty? All right, I'll make peace with you, and you can become my slaves if you are willing to have me gouge out the right eyes of your people. Well, Nahash was degrading in his response. Why did he say such an outlandish thing. The scripture tells us in verse 2. 
Nahash the Ammonite said to them, on this condition I will make a treaty with you that I gouge out all your right eyes, and here's the reason, and thus bring disgrace on all Israel. Nahash wanted to dishonor the people of God and dishonor the people of Israel. He wanted to humiliate them. He wanted the world to see that the Israelites were puny, weak, and cowardly. That they were willing to give up without a fight. And not only were they willing to give up without a fight, but they were willing to be so debased and so disgraced that they would invite their captors to gouge out their right eyes. Nahash was arrogant and overly confident of the victory in the response that he gave. For the people of Jabesh Gilead requested a week to see if they could assemble an army to fight against Nahash. Notice verse 3. The elders of Jabesh said to him, Give us seven days respite, that we may send messengers throughout all the territory of Israel. Then if there is no one to save us, we will give ourselves up to you. Now notice how upfront the people of Jabesh Gilead are. They lay out their plans, and they say to Nahash, give us seven days. Let us send out a cry for help among all the tribes of Israel. Let us see if we can gather together an army, and if we can't, well then, we'll give up. But give us seven days. Nahash was glad to give them a week's time to try and get help. He didn't immediately attack. He didn't say, no, why in the world would I do such a thing? Why would I give you the time to send for the cavalry to get reinforcements? No, he's fine with that. Why? Because it played into his purpose. His purpose was to bring disgrace on all of Israel. And how better than to disgrace all of Israel by finding out that no one in Israel was willing to stand up and fight against the king of the Ammonites. And if they did muster an army, he was quite certain that he would defeat them. So he could disgrace all of Israel as they came together as one group of people to fight against Nahash, and he thought he was going to soundly thrash them and thus bring disgrace upon the entire nation. Nahash is not at all concerned. He says, go for it. So the people of Jabesh Gilead turned to their fellow Israelites for help and not to the Lord. Notice verse 3. The elders of Jabesh said to him, Give us seven days respite that we may send messengers throughout all the territory of Israel. Then if there is no one to save us, we will give ourselves up to you. They did not say, give us seven days to pray and fast. They did not say, give us seven days that we might seek the will of the Lord. That we might inquire of Samuel to see what God is willing to do to help us. They did not offer sacrifices nor did they repent in sackcloth and ashes. They did not ask God to do a single thing. And yet, God was at work, even though they did not ask for God's help. God would provide them deliverance, even though they did not ask him, and even though they thought he could not. God would prove that he could do exceedingly abundantly above anything that they asked or thought. Secondly, God is to be glorified as the one who is able to do abundantly above all that we ask or think as revealed in the actions of Saul. Verse 4, when the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul, they reported the matter in the ears of the people, and all the people wept aloud. Now behold, Saul was coming from the field behind the oxen, and Saul said, what is wrong with this people that they are weeping? So they told him the news of the men of Jabesh. 
So notice the account. When the people heard the news that came out of Jabesh that they were under siege and that this king was going to gouge out their eyes, the people of Gibeah wept. They were saddened. They were saddened. But they didn't know what to do about it. It never crossed their mind to seek the Lord's help. They thought it to be a hopeless situation. And so they hung their heads and they wept. When Saul heard the account, he had a righteous anger. For God was at work in Saul, verse 6, and the Spirit of God rushed upon Saul. And the Spirit of God rushed upon Saul when he heard these words, and his anger was greatly kindled. God moved Saul as God had done earlier, enabling Saul to prophesy. This was in keeping with the way that God had enabled Samson to have strength and victory over his enemies by the Spirit of God rushing upon him. Here, God motivates Saul to anger at hearing how Nahash was seeking to disgrace all of Israel. For it tells us in verse 6 that when he heard these words and his anger was greatly kindled. We know that Saul's anger was a righteous anger because it came from God. It was the Spirit of God that caused Saul to become angry. And we know that it was a righteous anger because the word that is used in this text. It is a word that is different from the other Hebrew words that are translated into English as anger. It is a word that speaks of a righteous anger. A righteous anger. God was at work in the life of Saul, even though Saul was not seeking God's help in any way. There is no mention in this text of prayer on behalf of Saul to seek the Lord's help. And there is no reflection on what Samuel had said earlier when they had publicly announced that Saul was to be king. If you remember, just a very brief time ago, they have announced publicly that Saul was to be king, and Samuel reminded the people with these words. Now Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah, and he said to the people of Israel, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you have rejected your God who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses. And you have said to him, set a king over us. So they had rejected God. So it didn't even come into their thinking that this God who delivered them from the hand of the Egyptians, this God who delivered them from the foreign nations, is the same God that could have delivered them from the Ammonites, from Nahash. It never comes to mind. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything that they asked or thought. Rather, Saul takes matters into his own hands and threatens the people if they do not come out to him in battle. Verse 7, he took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hand of the messenger, saying, Whosoever does not come out after Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. So if you don't come out to me, then I'm going to do to you the same thing that I'm doing to this oxen. All right, you're going to be cut up. You better answer the summons to war. So we have to ask the question, why would the children of Israel come to the defense of the people of Jabesh Gilead? Now at this point, there's a tremendous backstory to this passage. One of the difficulties I have in preparing messages is always knowing how much detail to give. This is a sermon, it's not a Bible study, (laughs) and so there's a tendency to overlook a a lot of material. But this morning, I'm going to get into some pretty heavy detail because the backstory is tremendously important for us to understand what is going on here. So as we get into the backstory of this particular portion of scripture, 
that's going to illustrate that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, we need to keep some things in mind. First, remember that the book of Samuel is taking place at the tail end of the time of the judges. So the book of Judges is in the t- same time period and frame of First Samuel. They coincide. Now when one reads of the oxen being cut up and being sent out to the 12 tribes of Israel, it should bring to mind an event that happened years earlier when a Levite cut up his dead concubine and sent parts of her dead corpse to the 12 tribes of Israel. How many know that story? Would you raise your hand? You're familiar with that story? Thank you. A good many, good many of you. In Judges chapter 19, verses 29 and 30, it says this. And when he, that's the Levite, entered his house, he took a knife, taking hold of his concubine, after she had died, he divided her limb by limb into 12 pieces and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. And all who saw it said, such a thing has never happened or been seen from the day that the people of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it, take counsel, and speak. Now, if you're familiar with that story, there are a number of connecting points between that story and our passage. The first connecting point is this. The narrative of the Levite and his concubine begins with this introduction, Judges 19.1. In those days, there was no king in Israel. A servant Levite was sojourning in the remote parts of the hill country. It's reminding us in Judges chapter 19, this is happening when there's no king in Israel. It's speaking of the fact that there is no earthly king, where in our passage there is going to be an earthly king. There is Saul. And it's also speaking of the fact that at that point in time in their history, they had rejected God as their king. And in our particular passage, they are still rejecting God as their king. The story in the book of Judges is of a Levite who is traveling with his concubine and a servant. In their travels, they need to stay overnight in a city. The servant says that they are near the city of Jabus and recommends that they stay the night there. But the Levite says, no, they ought to stay in a city controlled by the Israelites. And they, so they head for a city nearby that is under the control of the tribe of Benjamin. Listen to these words, Judges 19. When they were near Jabus, the day was nearly over. And the servant said to his master, come now, let us turn aside to the city of the Jebusites and spend the night in it. And his master said to him, we will not turn aside unto the city of foreigners who do not belong to the people of Israel, but we will pass on to Gibeah. Gibeah. That's where they're going to spend the night. Now, remember that Gibeah just so happens to be the city from which Saul is from. 1 Samuel 10, 26. Saul also went to his home at Gibeah. And in our passage, 1 Samuel eleven four, 4, when the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul. So our passage wants us to keep Gibeah in mind. So back in the book of Judges, what happened in that city of Gibeah that night that the Levite and his concubine stayed? Well, it turns out that the inhabitants of Gibeah were wicked and acted in a manner much like the people from the city of Sodom had acted much earlier. The people of the town of Gibeah gathered against the Levite and the home in which the Levite is staying the night. They take the Levite's concubine, repeatedly rape her through the evening, and come dawn, she dies from her abuse. The Levite finds her dead and cuts up the body and sends her pieces to each of the 12 tribes of Israel and says, what are you going to do about this? 
Well, the tribes want to punish the men who did this atrocity and disgraced all Israel. He said, such a thing should not be done that this disgrace would come upon all of Israel. But the leader of the Benjamites will not turn the culprits over to the authorities. Judges 20, verse 9. But now this is what we'll do to Gibeah. We will go up against it by lot. And we will take ten men of a hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel, and a hundred of a thousand, and a thousand of ten thousand, to bring provisions for the people, that when they come they may repay Gibeah of Benjamin for all the outrage that they have committed in Israel. So we're going to pay these people back for all of the outrage, for all the disgrace that they have brought upon Israel. So they decide that they're going to fight against Gibeah. Therefore, the authorities gathered the people together to wage war against the tribe of Benjamin, and they issued a decree that if any tribe would not come up against Gibeah and the Benjamites, they were to be punishable by death. After the fighting is over, and I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but after the fighting is over, it is discovered that one of the tribes had not come up to the battle. That tribe was from the city of Jabesh Gilead. Judges 21, verse 5. And the people of Israel said, Which of all the tribes of Israel did not come up in the assembly to the Lord? For they had taken a great oath concerning him who did not come up to the Lord at Mizpah, saying, He will surely be put to death. And they said, What is there of the tribes of Israel that did not come up to the Lord, to Mizpah. And behold, no one could come to the camp from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. For when the people were mustered, behold, not one of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead was there. So they fight against the people of Jabesh Gilead, and there is a great loss of life. Judges 21, verse 10. Now remember, in our passage, it's the people of Jabesh Gilead who are now in danger and are seeking the help of all the other tribes of Israel to come and fight for them. 1 Samuel 11, verse 1. Then Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead, and all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, Make a treaty with us and we will serve you. The elders said to him, Give us seven days respite that we may send messengers throughout all the territory of Israel. Then if there is no one to save us, we will give ourselves up to you. That's the story in a nutshell. So here are these, what I think are incredible ironies, an odd set of circumstances in our passage that help us to understand that things were working out far better than anyone could imagine that God was doing exceedingly abundantly above what anyone asked or thought. First, the fact that God would raise up someone from the wicked city of Gibeah to be king over Israel is amazing. Saul is one of the inhabitants of of Gibeah. Saul says earlier that he's of the least tribe in Israel. That is true, because they've just about wiped out every Benjamite because of their former disobedience. Saul questions Samuel, why would you choose a person from the Benjamites? Why would God raise up a person from the city of Gibeah? Secondly, that the people of of uh, Jabesh Gilead, who were unwilling to fight alongside their fellow Israelites, would now seek the aid of their fellow Israelites to save them in battle. One can readily understand why they were doubtful of getting any assistance. Why would anybody want to help this tribe when this tribe in time past weren't willing to fight for them? You can understand why they would think nobody's going to come to help us. We didn't come to help when they needed us. 
Thirdly, that the children of Israel would be willing to follow Saul into battle against a foe that they all viewed as being unbeatable. Why would these people want to fight against Nahash when all of them thought that he can't be defeated? And we find that out in chapter 12. Fourthly, the answer is not Saul's idle threat against those who will not follow him into battle. Notice verse 7 of chapter 11. He took a yoke of oxen, cut them in pieces, sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hand of the messengers, saying, Whosoever does not come out after Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done with, to his oxen. What can explain the people responding to that? That was an idle threat. Saul had no way of enforcing that. Saul had no army. Saul had no power. That meant nothing. So why in the peop- why in the world would the people be willing to fight a battle they don't want to fight, a battle that they don't think they can win, with a people that they are angry with? How do you explain any of that? Well, the answer is given us in our text. Notice verse 7. Whosoever does not come out after Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. Then the dread of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out as one man. God did a work in the people. God caused them to respond. God caused them to be afraid of the Lord's displeasure and respond by going out into battle. It was what God had done. But notice two things. First, nobody asked God to do anything. But the Spirit of God rushed upon Saul. And the Spirit of God stirred in the hearts of the people of Israel. No prayers, no sacrifices, no repents, no nothing. God did Abundantly above what they asked. And he did abundantly above what they thought God could do. They had given up on trusting in God and believing in his power to deliver. So thirdly, God is to be glorified as the one who can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think is revealed in the victory that he provided. God moved in the hearts of the Israelites so that they presented themselves for battle, verse 7. Verse 8, when he mustered them at Bezek, the people of Israel were 300,000 and the men of Judah 30,000. And they said to the messengers who had come, thus shall you say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, tomorrow by this time the sun is hot, you shall have salvation. You will be delivered. We will help you. When the messengers came and told the men of Jabesh, they were glad. And the people of Jabesh Gilead rejoiced when they heard that their fellow Israelites were going to help them. For it tells us they were glad at the end of verse 9. So the people of Jabesh told the Ammonites that they would come out to meet them the next day. 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 10. Therefore the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we will give ourselves up to you, and you may do us whatever seems good to you. Now here there is an unfortunate translation of the text. For they did not say that they were going to surrender it as it seems to read in the ESV in the King James. In the ESV it says, tomorrow we will give ourselves up to you. The NIV says, uh, uh, then said the Ammonites, tomorrow we will surrender to you. But they didn't say that. Uh, If you look at the uh, footnote, if you have an ESV study Bible, and I highly recommend that study Bible, it tells you the footnote in 11.10, give ourselves up to you can also mean march out to you. The speech of the men is deliberately ambiguous, unquote. So the King James translates it, therefore the men of Jabesh said, tomorrow we will come out to you. The uh, NAS, tomorrow we will come out to you. That's what they said, we're gonna come out to you. They didn't say whether they were gonna fight or whether they were going to surrender. They said, we'll meet you tomorrow. 
Well, they went out, and they didn't go out to surrender. They went out to fight. And the Israelites defeat the Ammonites, verse 11. And the next day, Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch and struck down the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And those who survived were scattered, so that no two of them were left together. So God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think is revealed in the celebration of God's people. Now there is the issue of putting to death those that refused Saul as king, 1 Samuel eleven twelve. Then the people said to Samuel, Who is that said, shall, shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men and put them to death. Remember, Saul had threatened the people when he summoned them to go to battle. Remember that the Jabesh Gileadites, who had failed to fight with their fellow Israelites, were put to death in the book of Judges. But here, here, the people that are unwilling to fight are spared. And their lives are spared. And it draws our attention back to 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 27. When Saul was first announced to be king, but some worthless fellow said, how can this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no present, but he held his peace. There were those people that said, what can Saul do for us? He can't do anything. Why should we honor him as king? So Saul says, don't put these men to death. Why? Saul says, God brought this deliverance. This wasn't me. (laughs) This is what I did. This is what God did. God had brought the deliverance. These men should be spared. These men's lives should be counted as important. Why? Because God had done exceedingly abundantly above anything that anyone had asked him to do or anyone thought he could do. Saul recognized by the circumstances, by everything that had taken place, by all the untoward events, that God had been at work. The people and God that Nahash had sought to disgrace had brought honor and glory to God and his people. The God brought a great revival among his people. 1 Samuel eleven fourteen. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom. This is the beginning of a revival. I will speak on that, that next week. We're having communion next week. And we'll be using that in prepare, preparation for communion. And I will be speaking on it the following week as well. For this is a tremendous revival that's going to take place. They had rejected God as their king. Now they're going to come back. And they're going to be subservient to God as their king in the next chapter. This is all preparatory. This is all God at work. This is all God doing abundantly above what they had asked or thought. For he not only is going to give them physical deliverance, he's going to give them a spiritual deliverance. He's going to change the hearts and minds of the children of Israel. They're going to be able to start anew and afresh with God. I'll say much more about that next week. And come prepared to take communion, although we'll be taking it a little bit differently than what we're normally accustomed to. So, some concluding takeaways from this passage. What I want us to keep in mind is that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we ask or what we think. First, in manifesting his grace. In manifesting his grace. His grace to the city of Gibeah. This city that had brought, brought great disgrace to God. Who did outrageous things in the past. No one had prayed and asked that God would grant forgiveness to this city. No one prayed and asked that God would raise up a person from Gibeah, to honor and glorify God. Nobody said, do a work in this this wicked city and bring someone forth that is going to bring glory to you that in times past had brought disgrace. 
No one had asked. No one had thought. But God did it. But God did it. Second, in granting and accomplish deliverance in times of need, the children of J. Bash Gilead just looked for a human deliverer. They never prayed. They never asked God for help. They just simply sent out a message to the children of Israel. Are you willing to fight with us? And yet, God was at work, doing exceedingly abundantly above anything that they had asked or thought. Third, in transforming a people and bringing about spiritual renewal, here they are, a people that have rejected God, and they're going to come and they're going to renew the kingdom at Gilgal. As I say, I'm going to say so much more about that next week. But here is spiritual renewal. Here is spiritual revival. Here is the nation being turned on its head. What are we to learn from a passage such as this? Well, first of all, it's historically true. It's important to understand the progression of what's happening in the nation of Israel. But it should teach us great truths for our nation and our time. It should teach us, number one, that it's never too late. It's never too late. We can sit and and we can lament and say, you know, there was a time in our history when we were a more righteous nation than what we are today. And we can lament and we can weep over the sad state of affairs. And we should. There is much that is lamentable about what's going on in our nation today. But more than just weep, may God increase our asking and our thinking. May we be moved not to ask for a human deliverer, but ask for God to deliver us, for God to be at work in the lives of people's hearts and minds, to change a people that we might love one another, that we might care for one another, that we might support one another, that we might desire to live righteously and holy. That we would become a different city and nation than what we'd been in the past. That he would transform us, even as he transformed the people of Gibeah. God can bring peace among warring factions, as he did the people of Gibeah and Jabesh Gilead. God can bring healing to groups of people that have harmed each other in the past and done disgraceful things to each other in the past, as here he brings the people of Gibeah and Jabesh Gilead together. And he brings the people of Israel together. A lot of people had to forget a lot of things in order to end up with the unity that they're going to have in chapter 12. But by God's grace, that can happen. God can bring healing. God can bring restoration. God can bring a spirit of forgiveness. Where strife and division occur, there still can be unity and love and one people. And then lastly, God can restore faith and bring people to a newfound faith that they never had before. God can restore faith and bring people to a newfound faith that they never had before. Let's pray for revival. Let's pray that people who have faith but have been reluctant negligent, apathetic in their faith, might be stirred in their faith. That the Spirit of God would rush upon us. That the Spirit of God would renew us. That the Spirit of God would stir us up, first of all, as a people of God. So that anew and afresh, our thinking is increased and our asking is increased. 
that we have much more confidence in prayer than what we have now. That we've been more diligent in praying. And there'd be a sense of expectation that our prayers won't be in vain. That that's not just some useless activity. But our nation, our world could be turned on its head by the grace of God. We have known great revivals in the past. There's been the Reformation in the 1500s. There's been the Great Awakening in New England. There have been times in which God's spirit has moved. God can do exceedingly abundantly above anything that we ask or think. So let's ask God to increase our thinking. Give us a bigger sense of who God is, how powerful God is, how sovereign God is. May we learn to trust that our enemies are nothing in comparison to God. Our needs are nothing in comparison to God. When a world wants to disgrace us and gouge out our eyes and show us to be the puny and weak people that we are, May we rise up with the same kind of indignation that Saul rose up with, not for personal vendetta, but for the glory of God. God is being disgraced. May we believe that he will do a work in our hearts and the hearts of others. Pray to that end, because God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Let's pray. Almighty God, help us this morning from this passage of Scripture to learn that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. The people of Jabesh Gilead, when they saw the enemy, they were ready to surrender. And when they were so disgraced and humiliated that the enemy said, we're going to gouge out their eyes. They said, just give us a week. Maybe, maybe the children of Israel will deliver us. Oh, Lord, thank you for delivering them. Thank you for doing abundantly above anything that they asked or thought. Thank you for bringing healing to the relationships and raising up people that were willing to fight People who were afraid became fearless by your spirit and by your grace. Lord, we don't instruct you of what to do, for you know all things. You know our needs. You know our nation. You know our world. You know the turmoil. You know the unrest. You know the discomfort. You know the fears. You know the agonies. You know the frustrations. And Lord, we just turn to you anew and afresh. And we pour out our hearts and say, God, deliver us. Help us. Do abundantly above anything that we have asked or thought. And may you glorify yourself. May your name be exalted. And may we all rejoice to see what you have done. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's been quite a while since we added a new song, since COVID started. It's kind of been delayed for a while, and this is one that I wanted to add for a while, and I realized the pastor was going to be in 1 Samuel 11. I thought this was the perfect week for it. It's called The Lord is My Salvation, and there is uh, a need for some optimism, not blind optimism in the world, not a trust in a person or persons or just something like that, but in our God, and this song points to that very thing. It says, Who is like the Lord our God, strong to save and faithful in love? The Lord is my salvation. And as you see the song go on, you'll see at the end it says, The Lord is our salvation as well. So would you stand with me as we sing this? I'm going to begin by singing verse 1, and then you can join. We'll sing that verse again together as a congregation. The Lord is my salvation. The 
grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from a raging sea and I am safe on the solid ground the Lord is my salvation let's sing that together the grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea and I am safe on the solid ground the Lord is my salvation now verse 2 I will not fear I will not fear when darkness falls His strength will help me scale these walls I'll see the dawn of the rising sun The Lord is my salvation Who is like the Lord? each promise of his word when winter fades i know spring will come the lord is my salvation who is like the lord keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. Let's sing together majesty. Majesty Worship his majesty Unto Lift up. 
Thank you. You may be seated.